Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Incorporating Martin Mac Encore and ELP into Modern Lighting Design presented by Paul Collison. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. Just to let you know, we have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series that can be found on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily and we have over 20 sessions scheduled for the remainder of July and August, so watch for those on your calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Paul Collison, the presenter for today's webinar. Paul has over 25 years of experience in various facets of lighting design, including multi-camera broadcast, dance, opera, theater, fashion, large-scale public events, and video content creation, as well as video mapping and replay systems. Paul works extensively throughout the Asia-Pacific region and beyond. And I'll pass it over to you, Paul. Great. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for uh, giving us your time. I hope we can uh, make it worthwhile for you. Um, while we're on the thank yous, I wanted to thank uh, Show Technology for allowing us to present from their uh, office today. Um, we've had a few internet worries, so we're held together with sticky tape and blue tack at the moment. So with any luck, we'll, uh, we'll keep it together um, all the way through to uh, the end of the presentation. Like Laura said, it'd be great if you could, uh, if anything through the presentation piques your interest, if you have a question, if I haven't maybe covered a certain subject to, uh, to the degree that you'd like, then please feel free to uh, drop a question in that chat window because we'll try and leave the last 15, 20 minutes or so for a bit of a discussion because I feel that's when it becomes the most valuable. And I think even I'd get bored of hearing myself talk for 40 minutes. Um, okay. So this session, uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, incorporating Martin Mac Encore and ELP into modern lighting design. Um, it's probably more apt just to call it why I think Mac Encores are cool. Um, and, uh, and I think that's kind of where the whole theme of this came from. Um, the Mac uh, Encore series uh, and now the ELP fixtures have uh, become a bit of a favorite of mine uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And I'm going to take you through a bunch of the reasons as to why that is uh, and, uh, and to why there aren't too many shows where I wouldn't have uh, one, of, uh, these, one of these types of fixtures or both or all. Um, all right. So in order to do that, though, we're kind of going to go back to the beginning so that we can uh, put a few things into context. So... Starting off with my history from Martin, the first moving light that I ever used uh, was one of these little puppies, a, a 1004 RoboScan um, with the little rack controller and they were incredible um, pieces of technology at the time and we look back on them now with a certain degree of fondness and, uh, and also frustration. Um, but uh, this was the, 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 I guess, the start of uh, my lighting career, but also the start of my um, interaction with moving lights or intelligent lights. Now, at this time, moving lights were really just um, frou-frou, colour and movement, mainly, you know, discos and bands. You wouldn't see, you'd hardly see anything on, on television. The light levels weren't high enough uh, out of these kind of fixtures. Um, but uh, it was it was really the beginning uh, of it all. Um, but it wasn't really until the Mac 500s and Mac 600s came along that moving lights um, for me uh, really became a bit of a thing. I think, as I said in my last presentation, I wasn't part of the very light club. Um, so for me, the the first real moving lights I got to use were the were the Martin Mac fives and sixes, um, which were a staple of all of our shows, geez, through through the 90s and early 2000s, or the latter part of the 90s at least. Um, and so, and we go from those through the Mac 2000. So there's a, there's a, a massive range of, of uh, Martin fixtures there that um, have really permeated different points in my career. Uh, but really right up until the launch of the Encore, so any, any moving light 
you know, whether it be for Martin or anybody else, was generally resigned to artistic, to the artistic side of things. So gobo projection, aerial effects, all of those other things. We really didn't use moving lights um, to light people's faces, uh, you know, or use them in, in theatre shows to a massive degree where we were actually lighting scenery and people. Uh, that, those sort of jobs were resigned to fixtures like the Parkan, um, you know, and the Parkan kind of came about, uh, the point I'm going to make here is that a lot of these in, uh, instruments like the Parkan, like the Fresnel, uh, the Profile to a lesser degree, all came from different industries or different applications that were never truly designed for our theatrical um perspective so you know the park hand came from aviation the fresnel lens came from lighthouses um so or the park hand came from aviation and the automotive industry i mean they were car headlights for a long time um so it when it comes to lighting instruments we're really only probably only in the last I don't know, 10, maybe 20 years where we're really starting to see instruments that were actually developed purely for our industry and for our applications. Uh, and so that takes me to learning about light. Being a lighting designer is not just about getting 100 Sharpies and creating a cool shape, although there are plenty of people out there that call themselves lighting designers and make a lot of money and have a massive career out of doing such things. Um, but there are a lot of us who use light to light faces, light scenery, and in order to do so, you have to have an inherent understanding of the qualities of light and how it behaves. Um, and through my education, some of it formal, some of it less formal, a lot of it through trial and error, uh, a, lot of, a lot of that side of uh, my knowledge came from using incandescent or tungsten sources. Um, which sit in that 2700 to 3200 um, Kelvin range of color temperature. Now, you can see here in this list, we've, uh, you know, we start off with a candle, which sits around 1700, so it's really quite warm. The incandescent and tungsten fixtures sit in that 2700 to 3200 um, range. Uh, and then, of course, you go through to the high color temperatures. Now, you'll see on the end there, something that we call CRI, which most of you will uh, hopefully have a, have a basic understanding of. Uh, and that's the color rendering index. And that will give us, uh, that's a rating we use on a different, different light sources to give us an understanding of the quality of the light. So a metal halide fixture that you would normally see in a, in a factory unit that might light up a uh, a rehearsal, uh, like a training centre or a car park or, or factories, that has a relatively low CRI of 60. Um, sunlight and tungsten lights, of course, uh, have a much higher CRI, closer to 100, 100 being the, the optimum level. Um, so when it comes back to light sources that we use to light people and light scenery and light things that we want colour to render properly, that's important that that CRI is quite high. So for those of us that learnt to light with tungsten and incandescent sources, we are used to seeing a relatively high CRI out of our fixtures, so close to 100%. Uh, so uh, you've probably seen charts like this before, and these will explain a little bit about CRI. Uh, you'll see here that uh, the wavelengths uh, in daylight uh, are quite consistent throughout the spectrum. Incandescent fixtures render colour beautifully, but then you get to fluorescent lights, which have really big peaks and troughs in different parts of the spectrum. So if you were to light something with a fluorescent light, for example, uh, and, and these are very generalised charts too, by the way, I don't uh, think that they are 100% uh, accurate for every, every uh, fluorescent fixture or incandescent light, but in general, Fluorescent lights have lots of peaks and troughs in their output. So the colours that are rendered that they're lighting aren't necessarily true to form. Halogen fixtures have a beautiful curve. And you'll see down the bottom here, the cool light LEDs and the warm light LEDs in general uh, have a different dynamic as well. I will point out that this is a bit of an older chart and we can, with modern day LEDs, have a much more refined representation of the colour spectrum. 
Uh, so getting back onto my journey with, the, uh, with Martin, the first real fixture that, uh, that I felt definitely in the range that was suitable for lighting faces and, and for scenery was the TW1. And of course, that was a tungsten light source. Uh, it had an 80 volt source in it. Uh, it had a very limited zoom range, um, but the TW1 was a favorite for a lot of people uh, for a long time because it was a true light source in a moving the light form factor. Um, now we talk about the zoom, the limited zoom. One of the fundamental problems with getting a tungsten light source to output uh, through a lens array, and I'm gonna jump forward two steps here, is, <coughs> excuse me, is harnessing the light and pushing it through the optical chain. And you can see in this very erratic diagram here that the, the reflector here is harnessing as much light as it can from the source and pushing it through the secondary focal point to go down the optic chain. The big challenge with tungsten was that it required a fairly large aperture uh, to push the light through, which meant lenses needed to be bigger, the lights needed to be longer in order to uh, properly create bigger zoom ranges in the fixtures. So you'll find that in fixtures uh, of the day with tungsten sources like the Source 4 Revolution or the VL1000 um, had the bigger, they were quite massive fixtures in order to get uh, the zoom ranges required for a professional uh, environment. The VL5 there was probably one of the first uh, well-respected tungsten light sources, but again, it was a theatrical fixture for you know, aerial effects and we wouldn't really use VL5s too often to light too many things. Uh, so I know this is a, a long journey to get to what could probably be called the start of the presentation, but it's important to note where we've come from in order to understand why the Encore resonates so well with a lot of modern designers. Anybody who's come through this world of uh, tungsten light sources really values a high CRI and a quality of light that's not normally associated with a moving head um, or an LED. So after a, a long, long wait, oh, actually, no, I'm going to go back a step too, because there are, uh, no, I'm not going to mention that. That's right. We'll come back to that. Um, so we finally arrived with the Encore series uh, from Martin, which is obviously LED based. Uh, there's the profile, uh, or the performance rather, and the wash unit. And the first thing that uh, I really learned about these was that they obviously they come in a warm white and a cool white, um, which I have to say, and to be totally honest, I was really disappointed with at the beginning because I really wanted it all to be in one fixture. Uh, but once you understand the complications between creating a quality light source and maximizing the output, uh, they actually are very, very different fixtures uh, and, and very useful in different applications. Um, so part of what's so special about the Encore series is the fact that they are a fixed color light source. So they use a subtractive color mix with color flags to a, like a traditional moving light in order to change their colors, um, which is fine because for the most part, what we're really doing with, with uh, an Encore fixture is we're using them to light faces and we're using them to light scenery and things that we want the color to be rendered as accurately as possible. Uh, one of the great things was that there was a wash light released at the same time as the profile or, or not long after. So we have a, a pigeon pair here. We have two things that complement each other. So instantly in a theatrical environment, you could have a, a spot fixture and a watch, wash fixture that had identical uh, color attributes and features uh, across the system, which um, is an incredible, incredible advantage. So let's have a quicker look at the warm uh, fixture for a start. And you'll see uh, across the spectrum there that uh, the color rendering is completely evened out compared to the diagram that I showed you earlier with the new modern fixture. The TM30 range has almost every uh, color or virtually hitting the 90s. So 
uh, it will get you as close to uh, a, a, a tungsten fixture as, as we could probably get right now with an LED fixture. With a CRI greater than 90 uh, means that we can, as accurately as possible, represent the colours and features of uh, the objects that we are lighting. Uh, and you'll see here down in the colour evaluation sample, uh, again, we have a broader range of colours uh, that are showing us fairly high scores uh, in each of their ranges. Um, so the other things, I need to have a drink. I haven't talked this much without being interrupted for a long time. So excuse me. So one of the things to, um, that first comes to note with the uh, with the on-call range is the zoom range, 12 to 48 degrees, which is fantastic. It really gives us some versatility uh, in the fixtures. You know, a, a tighter beam means we can put them further away for some longer shots, uh, and we can actually get out to 48 degrees, which is a which is a, a reasonable, quite a reasonable zoom range for a moving light these days. Uh, something that was really unthinkable uh, with a tungsten light source in a fixture of this form factor. Um, so having a great uh, zoom range is incredible. The warm white has a light source of 3000 K, which is right smack bang in the middle of where we're used to sitting uh, when we talk about a tungsten or halogen light source. So said the CRI sits greater than 90. Um, the luminous output figures, I'm not even gonna go into because they are a little hard to compare, uh, but I will show you some photos uh, a little bit later on. So initially, when the Encore range came out, I, it was the warm fixture that really excited me because it was close to what I was used to seeing in a, in a tungsten uh, studio or in a tungsten fashion uh, scenario. And that's the fixture that I actually really thought was going to uh, be my staple fixture for a, a long time afterwards. Uh, so it took me a little while, and pardon the pun, but it took me a little while to warm up to the cold fixture, um, which, as you can see here, is not quite as accurate in its color representation as the warm, uh, but still has some relatively high scores uh, across the board. Its CRI sits greater than 80, uh, which is still pretty high. And when you think about in a cold environment, we were generally using uh, discharge light sources in follow spots. Uh, and it's really only in the last probably five to 10 years where we've started to see follow spots, maybe only five years, where we've started to see follow spots with a CRI that sits greater than 80. So for a long time in the cold environment, we were, or the higher color temperature environment, we were more than happy to sit uh, at a CRI of you know, 60, 65. Um, so to see a light source coming up to 80 in, a, in the cold part of the spectrum is, uh, you know, is impressive and useful. The zoom ranges are all the same. Uh, the CRI sits the same. The, the output of the cold picture is a little bit higher, but again, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so it was it was really after some use where I started to realize that the cold fixture on its own was a, a, a really uh, special fixture because it, uh, with its slightly higher output than the warm, uh, sorry, Zoom sending me a strange message. Um, with a slightly higher output than the, the warm fixture, it meant that we could use it in, uh, in some environments that were probably larger, a little less forgiving. So we're just going to have a quick look at a show that we did, uh, that we have done each year up until COVID. I think it's going to take a bit of a break next year. Uh, but this is the Eurovision Australia Decides show that we do on the Gold Coast. And it's a show I reference a lot, but it's probably because we've got some good documentation and good photos. So I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, uh, this is a, an aerial view of the plan. The blue fixtures on the plan, and I'll zoom in a little bit here, are the fixtures that uh, are the Encore Colts. So uh, this is, a, this is a, a, a smallish kind of stadium that we do this, uh, or arena rather, that we do uh, this show in. And you can see here, we, we have four colds out the front, two for a more of a side on oblique shot, uh, four backlights buried up in the back here. And then this guy here is just a real high side um, a fixture for us. So when you think about the fact that there were hundreds of fixtures I can't even remember how many in this design the the fact that we have two four six eight ten eleven fixtures here which are all responsible for lighting faces only um, that's a pretty incredible scenario 
I'm also going to point out that we didn't use follow spots on this show. So we used a system called spot track to turn the encores into uh, a follow spot. So they were computer operated uh, behind us at front of house uh, so that we could use the same light source in an either fixed or hard position or as a follow spot. And that was front and back light, uh, which is really important to us because I, I love the consistency of the, the light source no matter where we are. Um, so here are a few photos. And again, you can see how many fixtures we have in the background, but we have, there's enough grunt out of our colds for one single fixture here to light our artists on stage with a single backlight. So amongst all of that going on, there's enough level out of those fixtures to do the job. Uh, you can see here, strong, strong enough for a, for a good strong backlight uh, on this artist. And again, she's, uh, she's off keyed further around from one of those fixtures out on the side uh, to light her and try and start the scenery a little bit. Um, so even though the encores probably aren't really thought of as a you know an arena or a stadium fixture i really feel like they can compete at that at that um at, in, in that environment um you know again you can just see how big the scale is of these of, of this show and yet one single little encore is enough to pop out our artists um and so it's yeah it's incredibly impressive competing against any vipers um, and so I'm just going to show you a little bit of footage I, I hope it's not too steppy for you uh, I've had to turn the audio off because uh, it doesn't quite cut it here but this will just give you a bit of a, a an understanding of what the encores uh, what the encore colds are competing with here it's quite sterile without music all that tight editing. So every one of these faces um, and backlights is uh, is an encore cold. Uh, and what I'd like to show you here, one of, one of the things that I really liked about using the encores uh, as a key light on this show um, is the fact that we could change color. So this artist here, we, we actually dropped an extra fixture on the floor down the front to uplight him uh, for the verses so we could warm up the, the color of the fixture for his verses and then flick to, a, to an off key, uh, an off axis key, excuse me. Uh, for his uh, for the for the bigger moments in the song, and these were the the two fixtures out wide here. We had a we had a big jib on this side that would, which is why the key lights are all stacked to the left side here. Um, but you can see even coming around from the far side and and giving him a, a fairly uh, off axis key, um, it's all it's all still working, and the the versatility of being able to light him from the front. Uh, and the and the other off-axis positions really gave us some good options. Um, and now this is a little awards show uh, that we've done a few times uh, in one of the smaller venues here in Sydney. And again, a cold encore coming in against a, a big bright LED screen, uh, and they're competing. So the, the the point I'm really trying to make with uh, with these couple of videos is the fact that. Um, the, thanks, JD. Uh, are the fact that um, there is more than enough level out of them to uh, compete uh, for, for for level uh, in some of those those bigger environments, um, and that leads me to my next point. Um, 
is that not only are the encores just resigned to face lighting or scenery, uh, same show uh, I was just talking about here, but every fixture is an encore cult. So all the moving lights you see here on stage are all encores. So we're now using them in a way that maybe they, they may have been designed for that, I don't know, but I guess that the, the point is, is that they are incredibly versatile. And if I, I can play this now, because I can talk over it. But all of the um, all of the profiles above the stage here are all on course. So you can see they're snappy enough in their gobo and color changes. Uh, their movements are quick enough that they can actually be used as a real moving light, as opposed to just a face light. Of course, all of our key lights in this scenario uh, are all on course. Um, however, uh, the the bulk of the fixtures were being used as moving lights. So you can see here that they really are just as useful and, and just as good as a used as a traditional aerial effects uh, aerial effect uh, as they are at home just being used with uh, as a key light or, or a scenery light. And more than punchy enough, as you can see there. Um, the other cool thing for these is uh, it, by using the encores all over the place is that when somebody comes up with a, with an idea to let's spin the artist around backwards for the first half of the song, we're not scrambling to rehang another key light. We could just choose the most appropriate light um, to light our talent. And it's exactly the same light source from the back as it is from the front. Um, so we've actually started to realize that it's incredibly useful having bulk encores on a show uh, in as, as moving lights as well, because they can easily double as a key light or, or as a backlight uh, as quickly as they can become an effect light. Um, so yeah, the, the point is very definitely, don't just think of them as a, as a light to light somebody with that. And they're not just a theater light, you know, as you saw before, Snapping in and out of gobos and colours with their movement makes them um, incredibly versatile. But we can't always have a billion encores hanging around. Um, anybody who's worked on a on a television show or or even a theatre show really um, has had the the producer rock up half an hour before you go to air. All the doors open and says, "Oh, by the way, we're going to put a host over here." or we want to do a hosting position over there or something's going to happen or over there. And you can't, you, know, you might not have the time to rig another moving light. You might not have the time to, uh, or, you know, all the money to have spare on cause kicking around. Um, so it was really exciting when the ELP range came out and we're looking at color engines that are very similar to the Encore series that side by side work incredibly well. Um, and so the, the warm white fixture, in, in my opinion, becomes a, a, a pair with the, with the on-call warm. So if we're doing uh, a show and we're, we're lighting in, in at that 3000K level, then I'll make sure we've got a bunch of VLP warms sitting in a case out the back ready to go so that we can quickly react to new hosting positions that pop up and light people with a, an almost identical light source. The same with the ELP CL. Um, I'll show you in a moment the color uh, rendering of those is incredibly similar to the cool white uh, encores. So these fixtures all of a sudden become incredibly useful um, and affordable, uh, but using a, a very, very similar color engine. Uh, so going jumping straight into the warm white fixture with a 36 degree lens on it, you can see here that the, uh, the CRIs almost at 97, um, which is a, a technically a higher quality light source than the Encore Warm. Um, high scores in the color evaluation sample and the spectral distribution is, uh, is out of this world. Uh, and it's unfortunate because when you compare it to the CL, it makes the CL look almost not quite as, uh, as, as refined, but you also have to remember that the CRI in the, in the CL is, is greater than 90. So um, even though it, its scores don't look quite as high or the spectral distribution doesn't look quite as good, in the cool part of the spectrum, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it scores, it still scores, you know, a, a greater than 90 uh, CRI. Then with the ability to color mix on top of that, 
means that you have another layer of options. So if you're starting to use CLs as a backlight, for example, you can still have a high quality key light if your talent needs to spin around, but it also allows you the ability to change color at the click of a switch or the turn of an encoder. Um, so the, 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 the compact CL is, uh, is incredibly useful. And if we go back and look at our Eurovision Australia Decides show, um, you can see that we have our encores everywhere, but we have this hosting position that happens down off stage on the side here. So in order to light that, we need to get a fixture up into this area here. I'm, I'm hoping you can see my mouse. Um, but because those trusses were just jam packed with so many fixtures, you couldn't actually fit an encore in there. So we pull a CL out of a case uh, in order to key light uh, this hosting position. So it means, oh, I can turn the audio off on this one. Uh, so this means that we can light our talent for this hosting position with exactly the same light source that we're lighting from the other end. So we're not having to scramble in the truck to change color balances or to paint pictures uh, in order to get them to match. Um, so it's, it, it's and, and again, having a, a couple of VLPCLs in a, in a road case out the back is much cheaper than having some encores uh, kicking around doing nothing, waiting to be deployed, uh, and also much, much easier. Um, so the, the uh, ELP fixtures also come, uh, well, there, there's a standard range of lenses. So we've got the 19, the 26, the 36, and the 50. There's also a zoom lens that's, uh, that's imminent that we had a, a bit of a play with yesterday. Um, but uh, there are there are a couple of things I want to talk about these lenses. First, uh, first thing, it's not really a negative, but the the degrees on these lenses are actually slightly wider than it than they say. So the nineteen degree is probably a little closer to a twenty one. Uh, the twenty six is probably a little closer to a twenty seven. So they're a fraction wider um, than their than their stated uh, degrees, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It probably gives you a little bit more forgiveness, especially when you're on the edge with your photometrics. Um, but one of, the, one of the greatest things about these lenses, and I'm gonna change here for a moment, is uh, just their optics. Um, now, we, we did some tests in here yesterday with uh, some of the ELP lenses and with some non-native lenses. And you can see here, just with my iPhone, uh, not the world's greatest quality photos, but it's, it's infinitely apparent here that on the left side, the ELP warm white with a non-native 50 degree lens focuses in the middle, but it does get incredibly soft around the outside. Uh, and then you look on the right side here, the ELP warm white 50 degree lens with its native Martin lens on it, uh, and it's crisp all the way around. Uh, so that tells me, uh, well, and that's a very interesting story, and uh, there's not much more I can say about that other than the, the picture tells the story. Uh, and then likewise, we had a, another fitting uh, with, its, with a different lens on the left there. Uh, and you can see that it's you know, sharpish in the middle and it definitely uh, is, is soft on the outside. But if we used the other fitting with the ELP lens, you can see uh, on the right side here just how crisp uh, those ELP lenses are uh, across the field. And, and playing around with the light media yesterday, one thing that I really did notice was uh, how even the field is compared to uh, some of the other fixtures that uh, are on the market. So it, um, these lenses, are, I can't talk them up enough. I mean, the fixtures are, are, are great on their own, but the lenses, in addition to the fixtures, really makes the package um, great for want of a better term, probably. Um, the other thing I really like about these lenses are the, the, the you can see here the, the screws and the tightening um, screws that help you lock in the focus. Um, it's, it, it's a very industrial feel to it that allows you to play with the focus in a, in a finite kind of way, but then really lock it off. So it's not gonna drift. Um, and it's these little things that make the difference. You know, when you're talking with profiles, they, they're bitty, they've got shutters, they've got all these things that hang off them. Excuse me. 
but the it, it's the little things like the focus knobs and the mechanism to do the focus if you've got a hundred of these things to focus these are the things that you're going to notice um so that just just that simple mechanism there being able to lock off and just make just the slightest adjustments but then lock that adjustment in um really make these fixtures a, a pleasure to use um i'm just going to jump through now to and then there are some of the other features that really um are just so incredibly useful you know that we've all or most of us maybe have been in a theater where you are running around you might be working on your own there might only be you and a board op um and you're running around trying to focus things and you're screaming out hey can you bring up channel 427 please and that person has to walk from one side of the room to the other or well, with these you can just rock up to the back of them and push the enter button in uh, and the fixture will power up to full, uh, allowing you to focus and give you 30 or 60 seconds to focus the fixture before it, it goes back to DMX control. So you know, little, just little things like that, which make life so much easier for you, uh, particularly when you're working on your own or with a few people. Um, you know, th those little things uh, can save you so much time. The standalone modes uh, in the CL version, uh, we did a show uh, at the end of last year where we just had a gobo projection onto a wall that was part of a, uh, an artistic exhibition and, uh, and we just needed the fixture to turn on every day at a certain time and turn off. Uh, but we wanted it to cycle through colours, so we didn't want to have to add uh, a control system. So the, the programming within the fixture allows you to cycle through X amount of presets with a, with a predefined fade time. Uh, so we could just literally stick a, a timer on the wall and the fixture would turn on at five o'clock every day, go through its cycle of colors and then at midnight it would turn off. Um, so again, you know, a, a, another simple feature that just allowed us to do our job without having to add a control system or add other elements in. Of course, the, uh, both the ELPs have a strobe mode, RDM works with them. Uh, variable PWM dimming uh, if you need to adjust for refresh rates for camera and whatnot. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Again, so not used to talking. Um, so, I, you know, I, the, the ELPs, uh, you know, on their own, uh, and it's funny how we've combined them into this presentation, but uh, on their own, they are incredibly useful uh, and high quality fixtures. I, you know, I think that these pictures here really show the efficiency of the lenses, um, even if they don't probably pass as much light as, as some other products. Uh, and, and we're only talking fractions here. Um, the the trade-off is the crispness and the uniformity across the field, uh, which is something that I really, really like. Um, and combine that with the uh, refined color engines in both of these fixtures and it, it really makes uh, it just makes your job easier at the end because you're not having to fight the technology I think you know when you're when you're fighting technology in order to get the end result uh, that can get quite exhausting so having fixtures like these that um, almost make it a pleasure to do your job um, is is what's important and that kind of brings me to the end of the presentation that I've put together. Um, you know, I, I, I know I kind of probably rushed through a few things and I'm really interested to, uh, to get some questions and a bit of feedback, but um, yeah, Laura, how are you? Good, good. Thank you. That was a really great presentation. Um, we do have a question in here asking about um, viewing the replay. I'm assuming that you're, um, talking about the recording that we do of the webinar and we we do have the recordings for all of the webinars that we do out on our YouTube channel so if you go to Martin Professional um, give it probably three days we should have this one posted as well if you wanted to watch it or share that link with a friend um, let's see Nathan did you did you have any questions come in on your end uh, I did not I think Paul covered it very nicely. So, uh, I, I think uh, maybe something that's that's interesting to talk about would be more um, more about the the Encore Cold and um, did you uh, and the 
how it works together with like the ELP warm white. Do you ever put those two together or? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and this, uh, this probably brings me back to uh, something I said earlier where my, my initial reaction when I heard or realized that there were two skews in this line, there was the cold and the warm. Um, it, there's an element of frustration because I think, oh, great, whenever I want a warm, only the cold's going to be available. Whenever I want the colds, I know the warms are going to be available. I'm going to build my show in Sydney with colds and I'm going to go to New York and they're only going to have warms available. Um, one of the one of the, the great things I think you guys did was um, create the emulation modes in both fixtures so that the warm could run like a cold and vice versa. Um, so I've, d I've been in several instances where I've had uh, cold fixtures, but run them as warm fixtures and used the CL as uh, the accompanying, uh, not the CL, sorry, the, the warm white as the accompanying profile. Uh, and again, you know, the uniformity between the two and the, and the, the fact the colour engines are so incredibly close. Um, uh, that it, it, again, it's, it, you're not fighting the technology for, for, for once. You, you're actually going, oh, geez, I want this cold light to look warm. Oh, and it does, and it matches this warm profile over here, um, and that that is incredibly useful. I do have some charts that have those things overlaid, but but I feel in this environment it's probably a little hard to um, to look at uh, and properly display. You know, comparing the warm and the cold and where they sit in the color spectrum. Um, so if anybody just really wants to see that, obviously just let me know. But um, the, I, I, I'm invariably finding myself in situations where I, you know, I want, I need a cold, but I, but there are only warm fixtures. And sure, the trade-off is the output is is uh, is restricted. Um, but I found that as long as you can deal with the output difference uh, in the terms of your show, that um, I, I'm quite happy substituting, excuse me, a warm for a cold or vice versa. Um, based on availability, depending on some of those other little um, caveats. Okay, it looks like that was it for, oh, wait, here's one. Um, question for Paul, can you nuance a little more about the factors for you choosing between the colds and the warms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the factors for me are obviously how, where you're choosing your show to sit, uh, in, with color temperature. So, um, <clears throat> uh, if I'm, and, and a lot of times that is determined by other factors. So for example, if I go back and have a look at one of these, we can go back and have a look at some of these photos. So, you know, the, this show here, the, the Eurovision Australia Decides show, we shoot this um, in, a, in a colder colour temperature. So, uh, and the reason for that is that uh, if we've got cold from the front and we're using discharge fixtures from behind, then the colours of our fixtures are more accurately represented. We don't need to get the video screen to rebalance to, you know, to a lower colour temperature. So it's easier to honor the integrity of the fixtures if you work in their natural color space. Um, where, and, you know, and again, the, this, uh, this show here, uh, we shoot in a, in a high color, or this year, for example, we shot in a high color temperature uh, and we had encore cold. So everything sat in its native space. Um, where the, the warms I really like using when we are using tungsten fixtures, for example. So if we are looking at using, you know, Molfe audience blinders or you're after that warmer look, um, then, you know, or you're doing a show in an environment that has existing architectural lighting that's warm, um, then you might want to sit in that warmer environment. Uh, so therefore you would, you would color balance to warm. Um, you know, to, to that, that 3000 K range. Uh, you know, when you start looking at theater shows, for example, that you, you can then become a, to a degree, you're the master of your own domain there because you can sit in whichever color space you want to. Um, although generally speaking, most 
theatre shows probably sit in that cooler, you know, they're, they're all based around the fact that it's a, it's a cool follow spot that's coming in. So everything is based around, uh, around uh, that temperature. In fashion, we tend to do cold colour temperatures for the majority of things. But when you start looking at swimwear or you have people exposing more skin, um, then you might want to sit in a warmer environment. Um, but if you're doing your show outdoors at dusk, then maybe you don't want it to be warm because the colour shift between the cool daylight and the warm light becomes a bit much. Um, uh, unfortunately, look, the answer to the actual answer to the question after all that blabbering is that there, that there is no cut and dried formula um, for choosing which way to go colour temperature wise. Sometimes it's based on fixture availability. Most of the time it's based on trying to sit in the native colour temperature of anything that emits light in the space. So video screens, windows that might go to the outdoors, um, LED technology. Um, so trying to sit in the native colour space is probably the one of the biggest aims. Okay, it looks like that was the last question that came in. Um, so if anybody has additional questions, you can feel free to email me and I can get that question over to Paul. Um, and then I think on that final slide, you had your Instagram information, right, Paul? I do, yes, there it is. Perfect. Down the bottom there, a personal one and a company one. Ones, they all involve light in some way, shape or form. All right, super. Well, thank you, Paul. It's always a pleasure to have you present for us. We really appreciate you coming back and doing the second session. No worries. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank you everyone for attending. Um, we're so appreciative of all of the time that you've been giving to us for these webinars. I see a lot of familiar names on there, so I know that you're coming back again and again. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us. I hope that these sessions have been helpful and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Bye, Laura. Paul. Thanks, everyone.